please uh, join me in welcoming our next speaker, Michael Fraser, uh, a lecturer in political and social theory in the School of Politics, Philosophy, Language, and Communication Studies at the University of East Anglia, UK, whose talk is titled Challenges and Opportunities in the Interdisciplinary Study of Empire. Well, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for, uh, to Christopher for putting this together. Uh, and thank you to Michael for suggesting including me. Uh, it's wonderful, really, to be included in this interdisciplinary community of scholars studying empathy. Uh, if you don't mind my going kind of meta on you, I'd like to focus in my talk not only on our shared subject of empathy, but also on our interdisciplinarity. Uh, there's a growing sense that the current structure of disciplinary divisions in the academy is both arbitrary and unduly constraining. So interdisciplinarity is the watchword of the moment. But most scholars are so utterly socialized into their segregated disciplines that it's often unclear how interdisciplinary research can proceed. Uh, I think that the long dead authors that I write about in my book, The Enlightenment of Sympathy, now available in Chinese translation, for those who prefer to read in Chinese. Uh, I, I think that the, the long dead authors that I talk about can provide us with a path forward for our interdisciplinary collaboration, in large part because they were pre-disciplinary. Uh, these 18th century sentimentalists were united in a common project synthesizing all of what are now the humanities and the social sciences to both understand and improve human nature via the human faculty that we now call empathy. This project could serve as an inspiration to the kind of analogous work that we're trying to do in the 21st century. But such interdisciplinary work on empathy faces serious challenges. My talk today will focus on four of them, which I call first, the challenge of terminology, second, the challenge of methodology, third, the challenge of normativity, and fourth, the challenge of neutrality. So first things first, um, while I'm temperamentally inclined with each of these to focus on the negative, each of these challenges is also an opportunity, a chance to shake up how humanistic and social scientific research is usually conducted and change things for the better. So first, the challenge of terminology. Empathy is so important for us that just as the apocryphal story holds that the Inuit have 17 different words for snow, there's a wealth of subtly different terms for the faculty of empathy available in every human language. In English, compassion comes from the Latin for suffering with or feeling with, and sympathy from the Greek for the exact same thing. Uh, the analogous words in many Indo-European languages are based on these ideas of either suffering with or feeling with. My favorite take on uh, these many words that are available can actually be found in Milan Kundera's wonderful novel, The Unbearable Lightness of Being. But uh, don't ask me about the Czech terminology. I'm not familiar with it myself. Challenge for the translator doing those passages uh, into English. Uh, so in both Latin and Greek, pathos and passio uh, have uh, an ambiguity. They can mean both feeling and suffering. And this leads to an ambiguity concerning both sympathy and compassion. In a narrow sense, both terms might be limited to the sharing of another's suffering. But in a broader sense, they might involve sh sharing any of another's feelings, pleasant or painful. Uh, Anglophone 18th century authors use the term sympathy in the broader sense reserving compassion or pity in the narrower sense uh, for some form of shared suffering. Pity, by the way, coming from the Latin pietas, which is also the source of our word piety, uh, which branched off in the medieval era to mean comp compassion in the narrow sense of shared suffering as well as uh, piety. Today, the word uh, pity has subtle connotations of condescension, but it didn't have those sort of condescensions in the Enlightenment era, either in English or in any of the Romance languages. Anyway, humanity and fellow feeling were also used in the 18th century as rough synonyms for sympathy in this broader sense. The key thing when working on these old authors, of course, is that the term empathy wasn't coined yet. 
It wasn't available until early in the 20th century uh, from the Greek empathos, in feeling. So in feeling rather than with, with feeling, sympathos. Uh, and it was coined in the 20th century in English as a translation of the older German term Einfühlung. So although each of these terms for shared feeling carries subtly different connotations in everyday speech, the distinctions between them are usually lost and they're frequently used interchangeably. Uh, it's for this reason that Hume observed in his 18th century English, tis very difficult to talk of the operations of the mind with perfect propriety and exactness because common language has seldom made any very nice distinctions among them. And things get even more complicated when you're not using one common language, but several or even a single language that's changed over time. Now, Nancy has done some heroic work to distinguish compassion, sympathy, empathy, and so on. But I think it would be a very strange coincidence if each of the many terms that we just happen to have in contemporary English each corresponded to one and only one real phenomenon, while the different set of terms available in other languages and other times and places didn't. But if our words don't carve the reality of empathy at the joint, so to speak, how can we talk about it clearly and consistently. I wish I had easy answers here, but I don't. But I think this is a genuine problem that can't be dismissed as merely semantic. And I think this is true for two reasons. First, the challenge of terminology raises the problem of terminological gerrymandering. And I think this is at the heart of a lot of Paul Bloom's recent polemics against what, if you look a little closely, is a very narrowly defined concept of empathy contrasted with things like compassion and sympathy that he's not against. Second, and more relevant for my topic here, there's a very strong problem of interdisciplinary communication when different conventions for turning the vague ordinary language vocabulary we have available to us, turning those vague terms into specific, precise, operationalizable terms of art is done differently in different disciplines. And unless we're extremely careful with one another, we'll talk past each other when our different disciplines operationalize these terms in different ways. The challenge of interdisciplinary communication is all the greater since it's not only the words we use to talk about empathy that create these problems, but also the words we use to describe our very disciplines. Take, for example, the word philosophy. In 18th century English, the terms science and philosophy could still be used interchangeably to refer to intellectual investigation as such. To isolate the philosophy of the Enlightenment as a distinct subject of scholarly inquiry, one to be interpreted by a community of philosophical specialists, separate from those devoted to the history of science or other forms of intellectual history, to isolate the philosophy of the Enlightenment in that way is to risk serious misunderstanding. And when we use two protean disciplinary words together, the possible confusion only magnifies. And this is precisely the problem with the phrase moral philosophy. Since the word moral also meant something rather different in the Enlightenment era than it does today, just as philosophy does. In the narrow sense, in the 18th century, moral could mean something like it does now. But it could also be used in a much broader sense to refer to anything having to do with the mental or social lives of human beings. So a professor of moral philosophy like Adam Smith was expected to teach what we still call by that name, but also what we now call psychology, philosophy of mind, sociology, anthropology, history, law, political science, and of course, in Adam Smith's case, economics. In 18th century English, moral philosophy in this broad sense, which includes all of what we now call the humanities and social sciences, was also often called, and, and you'll pardon the sexism of the past, the science of man. Moral philosophy meant the science of man. As is so often the case, the changes in the language we use to discuss philosophy and moral philosophy reflect deeper changes in social practices. The narrowing of the word philosophy represents a narrowing of the philosophical profession itself, 
as philosophers take their place alongside a host of other specialists in the modern university. Moral philosophy, in turn, is reduced to a mere subfield of this one small discipline. Outside of that sub subfield, most of the subjects once considered part of moral philosophy are now investigated using allegedly value neutral methods modeled on those of the natural sciences. So although all Enlightenment philosophers rejected that division and they felt free to cross what would later become disciplinary boundaries, not all of them did so in the same way. Kant famously begins his critical moral philosophy with the a priori metaphysics of morals, only then turning to empirical investigation to determine how imperfect real world creatures such as ourselves may be better broad in line with morality's independently authoritative demands. By contrast, other philosophers of the time seamlessly integrate empirical and normative analysis throughout their work. Asking, asking how creatures such as we are, possessing the kind of psychological constitutions that we do, can agree on standards of happiness and virtue tailored to our particular nature. This approach can be seen as culminating with Kant's estranged student, Johann Gottfried von Herder whose comprehensive history of humanity was intended as a grand synthesis of all of our knowledge about humanity and its virtues and its vices and its abilities to feel with one another through what we now call empathy. We can call the approach that Shaftesbury, Hutchison, Hume, Adam Smith, ha and Herder have in common empiricist, or as Michael Sloat and I and many others have done, we can call it sentimentalist. And these 18th century sentimentalists remain central to our understanding of empathy today. Indeed, Herder is widely credited with the coinage of the very word Einfühlung, later translated into English as empathy. Now, this may not be entirely accurate. As far as I'm aware, the noun Einfühlung doesn't appear anywhere in Herder's corpus. Uh, but the concept and its various verb forms are constantly present throughout his work. Herder argues that we imaginatively place ourselves into, into the situation of others feeling our way into their experience of the world. And this feeling our way into is a concept he discusses repeatedly. Okay, enough about vocabulary and terminology. Let's move on to challenge two, the challenge of methodology. Okay, so once we've decided to attempt an interdisciplinary empirical investigation of empathy in the style of the pre-disciplinary Enlightenment sentimentalists, the next question is how such an investigation should be conducted. Admittedly, Enlightenment sentimentalists weren't always the most methodologically sophisticated psychologists. In an era before the discovery of the full depths of the subconscious mind, most of them were convinced that the human soul was fully transparent to introspection. As a result, Hutchison could reasonably claim to discover the truth on human psychology, nothing more is necessary than a little attention to what passes in our own hearts. And consequently, every man may come to certainty in these points without much art or knowledge of other matters. Yet moral philosophy could not ignore the methodological changes that have, had occurred uh, in, in the previous century in natural philosophy. The remarkable effectiveness of new scientific approaches convinced Hume that with any question of fact, we can only expect success by following what he calls the experimental method. Now today's methodological innovators would certainly seem to agree Current proponents of what's called experimental philosophy or ex-fi, when they're being cute, uh, explicitly defend what they're doing as an attempt to reintroduce what Hume calls the experimental method of reasoning into moral subjects. But unfortunately for the ex fires seeking to claim Hume as, as one of their own, experimental like moral, like philosophy, is yet another English term that has changed its meaning since the 18th century. 
rather than recommending the controlled tests of today's laboratory science, Hume instead equates careful and exact experiments with the observation of those particular effects which result from different circumstances and situations. If experimentation in general is equated as it was in the 18th century with careful observation, in the case of moral subjects, experimentation merely involves close observations of the operations of the social world around us and the psychological forces within us. For Hume, who is most famous in his own time as a historian of England and an essayist, these observations were not to be conducted in the laboratory under controlled conditions, but in the uncontrolled reality of human life, a reality whose complexity he believed was best captured in history and literature. Although controlled experimentation will always be invaluable in psychology, as it is in so many other fields, humanistic inquiry also has a contribution to make when we're investigating the nature of human empathy. The great danger, as everyone uh, who conducts experiments is well aware, the great danger with laboratory experiments is that what they sacrifice uh, is that they sacrifice external validity in favor of a rigorous demonstration of internal validity. While there's often little doubt that in a particular controlled environment, it was indeed the experimental treatment that caused the observed effects, it's often unclear to what extent an experimenter's results can be generalized to other settings. For Hume, by contrast, following the experimental method is mostly just about deducing general maxims from a comparison of particular instances. The model here was Newton, who famously used his theory of gravity to explain everything from the orbits of the planets to the falling of an apple. As a result, Hume sought a general theory grounded in what was then called sympathy to explain all the diverse empirical phenomena which he observed in the moral realm. Sympathy is to moral philosophy what gravity is to natural philosophy. If the phenomena being explained are not sufficiently diverse though, if we don't explore a sufficient range of phenomena from the planets to the apple orchard, then the theory derived from them will lack the global applicability, universal applicability beyond the globe, necessary to qualify as a general theory. In this regard, evidence rigorously collected from a handful of undergraduate volunteers in the local psych lab is little better than the evidence philosophers have been using, use, been using for centuries, drawn from the intuitions of a group of faculty sitting around a seminar table, or even from our own famously armchair-based solitary introspection. Herder, in particular, was particularly concerned that the theories of virtue put forward by his contemporaries were unduly parochial. Woe to the philosopher, he writes with his usual dramatic flair. Woe to the philosopher who in making theories on humanity and manners and morals knows only his own scene. <clears throat> Herder, like Hume before him, thought that history is the only cure for philosophical myopia. I guess part of my case here is that we should have invited a historian. Uh, but in the case of Herder, the key thing is not to just study the history of one's own society or the richer and more powerful society south of Hadrian's Wall. He wrote, was a Scot writing the history of England, not to study one's own history or the history of England or the history of Europe, but the history of the world as a whole in all its diverse times and places. Herder wrote, Whoever does not make it his main focus to put together in imagination the taste and character of each age and to travel through the various periods of the world uh, with the penetrating look of a traveler hungry to learn, he, like that blind man of, uh, of the Gospel of Mark, sees human beings as trees and consumes in history a dish of husks without a kernel in order to ruin his stomach. Uh, when Herder studies the diverse cultures across all times and all places, including their arts, their literature, their religion, as well as their philosophy, their politics, and their economics, when he studies all of this as a whole, he sees that in humanity there lies one invisible seed of receptivity for happiness and virtue on the whole earth and in all ages, which differently developed 
appears in different forms. The human psyche for him isn't a rigid structure, but a flexible clay in the most different situations, needs, and pressure, forming itself differently. If we want to conduct a study of a human faculty like empathy, inspired by Herder's multicultural methods, we'll either need to master the full range of area studies and other humanistic subjects that he mastered, or at least mastered insofar as they could be mastered in the 18th century, or we're going to have to collaborate not just between philosophers and psychologists, but with colleagues from every corner of the modern university. Okay, so that's the challenge of methodology. We're not done yet. Third, we have the, what I call the challenge of normativity. Although disciplinary divisions can make communication and collaboration across the university quite difficult, those divisions might be worth it if they can be defended on other grounds. And one of the key ideas taken to separate moral philosophy and normative political philosophy from uh, other disciplines, uh, from scholars in other arts and sciences, is interestingly by reference to a misinterpretation of Hume, the famous view that so-called Hume's law draws a sharp boundary between is and ought. So we ought to have ought disciplines like moral philosophy and political theory. We ought to have is disciplines like psychology and history. Closer attention to Hume's work and the work of his fellow 18th century sentimentalists cures us of this belief in Hume's law. As Alistair MacIntyre famously pointed out decades ago, Hume himself regularly breached his own alleged law. Similar violations were committed by all of Hume's fellow Enlightenment sentimentalists. While it is true that we have to be careful to distinguish between matters of fact and matters of right. And Hume may be correct that we may not be able to derive one directly from the other. It's nonetheless the case that coming to understand the facts concerning human moral sentiments and empathy and other factors about human nature will, as a matter of psychological fact, influence those very sentiments. While identifying the psychological effect of this factual knowledge is itself a matter of empirical investigation, Enlightenment sentimentalists did not merely identify the psychological effects of self-knowledge in a value-neutral way, but also evaluated them normatively and concluded that they were overwhelmingly changes for the better. Shaftesbury explains, by examining the various turns inflections, declensions, and inward revolutions of the passions, I must undoubtedly come to better understand a human breast and judge the better of others and myself. So sentimentalist moral philosophers must begin with our moral sentiments as they really empirically are. They must devote a lot of their time and energy to ensuring that their descriptions of all the relevant facts about history and psychology and so on are empirically accurate. Adam Smith nonetheless notes that, quote, by the justness as well as the delicacy of their observations, they may often help both to correct and to ascertain our natural sentiments with regard to the propriety of conduct. And suggesting many nice and delicate attentions form us to a more exact justness of behavior than what, without such instruction, we would have been apt to think of. I think I'm going to be a better parent, for example, as a result of all that I learned from Darcy's first talk today. Uh, in this way, uh, either the Enlightenment or the contemporary version of what was once called the science of man represents not so much uh, an intellectual endeavor as a return to the ancient Hellenistic conception of moral philosophy as a kind of practical therapy the art of learning to think, feel, act, empathize properly, and hence to live well, and hence to become happy. Modern empirical science is valued not for its own sake, but insofar as it is the best means available to help us achieve the ancient ideal that predated modern science of achieving happiness through self-awareness. Shaftesbury, the most self-consciously neo-Stoic 
of all the Enlightenment sentimentalists, is convinced that the proper harmony and proportion of the soul is, quote, only discoverable in the characters and affections, affects of mankind, in which are laid the just foundations of an art and science su superior to every other of human practice and comprehension. Just like the British sentimentalists who preceded him, Herder too is well aware that a true understanding of the nature of moral sentiments does not, should not, leave those sentiments unchanged. Herder calls on us to build an empathetic understanding across otherwise insurmountable barriers of difference, not for its own sake, but to provide the insight necessary to take the morally appropriate stance on practical issues. Most importantly, and he was the first and one of the greatest voices uh, of what now looks like post-colonial theory, but was then you could see as colonial, anti-colonial or even pre-colonial theory, Herder urges Europeans to give up on what he calls their monstrous goal their imperial goal of compelling all the nations of the earth to be happy in her way, in Europeans' way. And this raises what I think is the fourth and most difficult challenge we face in the interdisciplinary study of empathy, the challenge of neutrality, or really the challenge of overcoming the ideal of academic neutrality. Everything that Herder did was directed to two goals the individual ethical goal of figuring out how to live as an individual and the political project of uh, encouraging uh, freedom from the great empires of his day and opposing European imperialism, both within the continent of Europe, within the declining Habsburg empire and within the globe as a whole. He's a, he's a hero of the Eastern European nationalist movements, not because, as he's often uh, depicted as, he was a, a, a proto-Nazi who believed in, in, in the folkish spirit of the nation, but because ev he thought every nation had a right to independence and freedom and to its own kind of happiness. Uh, so we're really quite far from the current ideal of scholarship as a narrow profession devoted to intellectual rather than practical, ethical, or political matters. Um, Herder's anti-imperialism makes clear that as soon as you start talking about empathy, global, as Michael calls it, unblinkered empathy, you're going to start talking about politics. And, and we face at this moment the fact that empathy has become a partisan issue. Uh, it was once claimed by all sides in the American political debate. We had a moment uh, briefly before 9-11 when the American political scene was one of bleeding heart liberals debating compassionate conservatives. But that's no longer the case. Any discussion of empathy in our moment quickly becomes a discussion of politics. We saw this at the end of the first session today when we, you know, the, 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 the moment when Trump comes up as he does in, in any conversation uh, we have right now. And, and it continued, of course, into the second presentation in a more sustained way. And that reemerged in the Q&A for, for the third talk. Uh, now, the thing is, when we're dealing with interdisciplinarity, different disciplines have different professional norms as to the proper relationship between uh, scholarly research and political activism. Uh, while philosophers are, are, are gathering to, to, to figure out how to, how to best resist Trump using philosophical methods, and I'm not sure that's the best way to resist Trump, but that's another matter. Uh, at the same time as we're having this debate in philosophy, social psychologists like Jonathan Haidt are taking the lead in a movement devoted to combating what they see as the undue left-wing bias in the academy. I think this is an important debate about professional ethics. And it's, it's actually the, the subject of what I'm working on right now. I figure a professional ethicist is, is of no use unless uh, he's doing some work on the professional ethics of his own profession. But I think it's pretty clear what my own position on this is when I can defend on another occasion. Uh, I think it's important, uh, I, I noticed hesitation when our first social psychologist uh, <laughs> began to stand on, on, on what she saw as her soapbox. And I, I say, stand proudly 
on your soapbox. If you want to understand empathy, uh, you're going to have to engage with the political implications of that study. Um, how am I doing on time? Two yeah, minutes? We, okay. we, we, we are eating into your discussion time. Well, there's no need. I can stop then. Uh, I'll stop standing on the soapbox. Good. Our first question uh, will come from a keynote speaker. You can chime right in. Unmute, unmute your microphone. Anyone there? And I invite Michael Sloat, uh, perhaps. Uh, okay. Uh, All right. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Um, very enlightening talk. <laughs> a very appropriate title for my description of your talk. Uh, Michael, there was something that creeped in, and maybe more than creeped in, to your discussion of all those enlightenment uh, figures or sentimentalist figures that worried me a bit. It was the idea that, you know, as we learn more about humanity, and the science, so to speak, of man, uh, we become more able to have happiness and virtue. Now, I think it's a major achievement of modern moral consciousness that the idea that virtue and happiness have to go together, okay, is not just accepted in the way it was always accepted, for example, in ancient Greece. So I'm wondering, you know, uh, do the Enlightenment figures have to make that assumption? Or do we have to go to Kant? Well, he's an Enlightenment figure too, but do the sentimentalists have to really assume uh, that, 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 that virtue and happiness go together on the basis of our knowledge of humanity? Or do we have to go to Kant and Pritchard for an idea that they might come upon? Right, so th this is, I think, one of the, the reasons why uh, Kantianism is so is so attractive because we have come to think uh, that in a way that would be would be very strange to to anyone in the the millennia of of the Aristotelian tradition in the West mm -hmm. that virtue and happiness can and must uh, come apart uh, that we have to have faith that one is rewarded with the other in an afterlife but we can't actually think of the kind of traits that lead to moral goodness being the same kind of traits that lead to individual happiness. Yeah. But I thought actually uh, Darcia's first talk today was a very good example uh, of, of why we need to return to that kind of pre-Kantian Aristotelian understanding of the relationship between virtue and happiness. And, and I think ultimately, now, there, there are people who read them differently as proto-Kantians rather than late Aristotelians. Uh, I, I think the sentimentalists side with Aristotle in that argument with Kant. Interesting. Uh, and, and, and I think they're especially, I mean, this is absolutely obvious in Shaftesbury. Uh, it becomes less obvious as the 18th century goes on and as, as, as we get closer and closer to the coming of Emmanuel. Uh, but I... I I think ultimately their entire approach makes more sense in the Aristotelian framework than it does in the Kantian one. Although of course Kantians who are sympathetic to certain features of humor Smith read them the other way. Very nice. I just have a few comments or possibly a comment and a, a brief question for Michael. Um, I, um, I appreciate your reference to a professional and practical ethics as kind of an, an, an outcurrents of some of the arguments that you've been making. And um, so this, I guess, follows um, your outline, particularly to methodology and your reference to uh, every corner of the university um, kind of bridging this gap about uh, the study of uh, empathy, but also quite possibly other very important areas of moral philosophy. Um, and so um, I'm I'm kind of interested in um, your view about uh, not only uh, the established divisions that exist currently within the academy, within the colleges of arts and sciences, but also quite possibly uh, uh, the disciplines of uh, university units that are focused on the professions, such as education and social work and medicine and law and engineering, and how those 
how those uh, very specific areas might address uh, some of the, the very important things that you've laid out in a, a previous paper that informs your, your uh, presentation today. I'd like to reference a reference in, in your paper, life is short and human needs are pressing. Sentimentalists therefore argue that it is their responsibility to their fellow humans to address moral questions of particular relevance to us as we happen to be. If philosophy is to become useful for human beings, Herder writes, then let it make then let it make the human being its center. And I say no, no, no better place where a human being is center than the professions that are committed to the flourishing of society, correct? Yes, uh, and, and certainly there was, I, I realize now, there, there was a kind of arts and sciences, liberal arts uh, bias in what I, I was saying. But as we think about our own professional ethics, uh, I, I think we need to acknowledge that, you know, we live in a vocational society uh, built around professions. Uh, the university is the kind of home of the meta profession because it's the place where all the other professions uh well not all of them there's also other forms of vocational training where many of the other professions and certainly the most powerful and influential ones also receive their training uh and and, and you're completely right that um it makes sense to understand the more um abstract or foundational or basic research that we do in the in the liberal arts has its effect on society very often through the way it feeds into the training of non-academic professionals in the professional schools of the university. Yes. That, that these, seems quite plausible. Yeah, and these emphasis on, um, this emphasis then on practical issues or how we can understand um, human betterment through um, you know, very on the ground kinds of understandings and notions about people living their lives and through life um, uh, in, in real and viscous, tangible ways, right? That uh, I get a sense that in some of the, the paper that uh, you used to form your uh, presentation today was um, that much of this has a, a pragmatist tone to it. Yeah, yeah. And, and there, there's... I mean, it's not a coincidence that the most famous recent philosopher to make a big deal about the moral sentiments was Rorty, right? That, yes. that there's, there's, there's a way in which this goes well with a pragmatist under, I just say it's an elective affinity, right? I don't want to commit myself to a pragmatist theory of truth, but certainly it goes well with a pragmatist theory of truth and with the American pragmatist right. truth. Very good, thank you very much. Oh, my pleasure, thank you. Anyone else? One more question. Speak up, unmute yourself. I really liked what you had to say, Michael. Oops, <laughs> sorry. Oh, we're in the echo chamber again. I think you need to just use either the front computer and mic or the one on your laptop and, and yeah it says it's muted in the room but then if i unmute it it doesn't work let's try okay now try muting your laptop okay can you hear me yeah that's that's much better now sometimes it works okay so um my comment was i really liked uh the way you laid things out i think this is really really important work that uh we all need to take into account. I feel like I need to read it though again to really have anything to say or ask. <laughs> but I'm very. Um, yeah, I should make clear it's out there, right? It, it's it, this is based on a chapter, yeah. the, the first chapter, in a book called Ethical Sentimentalism: uh, New Perspectives, I think, edited by uh, Karsten Stuber, S-T-U-E-B-E-R, and Remy uh, Debs. Ethical okay. sentimentalism will, will get you the chapter. Excellent. I'll look for it. Thank you. Michael, I think you sent that to us. Or Christopher, didn't you email that chapter to us? Yeah, that should be distributed. Yeah. I, I mean, what I was doing was th that, that chapter is about uh, the general challenge of interdisciplinarity and the study of moral sentiments. And I, I, I think all of that applies very concretely 
to this particular community dealing with this particular issue of empathy. Uh, but it, I think it's generalizable to other issues it's, in uh, the, the, the moral life of human beings uh, in, in, in all respects. Although, of course, you know, Michael and, and I and a lot of other people think that empathy is absolutely central to that. I, I have one question. Um, uh, did I, I get this right? Did you, this Jim Starbuck, did I get this right that you, you took a stand on the idea that virtue and happiness go together? Um, certainly the 18th century sentimentalists take a, a was, stand Were you on endorsing that. that? I think so. Uh, I, I think. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I, think, I think ultimately, to use the, the dominant example of our moment, I think if not perfectly, you know, there's, there's unforeseen tragedy, there's fortuna, uh, there's only so much that a human being can do. But if you think about how miserable the most evil people of our moment are, how clearly miserable they are, and how serene the most virtuous people of our moment are, I think the Aristotelian position becomes a lot more Possible. I must know different. There are the moral people. of outrageous fortune. Don't get me wrong. I, I, I really must know different immoral people from you. <laughs> uh, anyway, yeah. Are they really happy though? Deep down. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I mean, it's not that guarantees happiness. That Aristotle is not a Stoic. He doesn't think that virtue is all there is to happiness. He thinks there's a lot of luck involved too. But virtue is everything a human being can do. To increase as much as they can the odds that they will be happy. Do you want to take Kant's move here? Yeah. Do you want to also add Kant's move that, so that you're going to tie it together a little bit, the afterlife will fix things up? No, I, 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 if, you have, if you have Kantian rational faith, more power to you, my brother. But, but you uh, don't. I, I personally do not. No. Okay. Uh, Thank you. This, those who do. This, this conversation will need to uh, continue at another time uh, in order to make space for our last speaker.